So often in recovery, if we don't have a process that we're committed to, and if we don't have people who are experts who are dictating that process, we fall prey to kind of sleepwalking in recovery. And I will tell you, even 13 years later, if I get too bogged down with financial pressure or my coaching responsibilities in baseball or just life pressure or, you know, handling the responsibilities that I have to handle as an adult, I become this sleepwalking individual who forgets about my commitment to never go back to the sleepwalker I was before infidelity. What sleepwalking, I think, refers to is we're just surviving. We're just going through the motions. And very easily in recovery, you can just go through the motions. You can kind of just go to counseling. You can just kind of read books, but not really engaged. And you can find yourself incredibly frustrated. And in many ways, that frustration uh, is really manifested in the unfaithful because you're frustrated because nothing that you do seems to work, or you just can't make your spouse happy, or you just can't get it right. But to the betrayed spouse, that sleepwalking kind of spills more over into hopelessness because you are filled with a, a hope and an anticipation that maybe your unfaithful spouse is going to get it, and maybe they're going to rise up and do the recovery work that you're so desperately asking them to do. And so this sleepwalking for you very easily spills into hopelessness and despair and even despondency where the sleepwalking for the unfaithful can kind of spill over more into frustration that it's never enough and we're never going to get out of this. I think sleepwalking becomes really prevalent for those that have done enough recovery work to just be frustrated, right? It doesn't really take off. It doesn't really you know, gain wings, and there's a lot of momentum and a lot of healing and, and restorative moments. But sleepwalking can also happen early on in recovery when you're just trying to find help, right? You're online looking for people who know what they're doing, or you're exhausted trying to find therapists who might be experts or might know what they're doing, or you can't find anybody in your area. And so you just are kind of going through the motions, overwhelmed with pain and hurt and turmoil. And I want to tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. And this isn't going to be a sales pitch for product, but it is going to be more about trying to help wake you up or give you some pointers to wake yourself up or even maybe wake your spouse up from the sleepwalking that we go through. Before I go any further, I probably need to give you some insight. What does sleepwalking look like? Well, you're not engaged in recovery. You're going through the motions. You're not present with your spouse. You're not present with your partner. You're not present with your children. You're kind of just going through life, going through your job, going through even parenting or, or the boot camp online or a course or counseling where you're just kind of doing it to do it. You haven't really surrendered to the process and you haven't really given yourself to the moment that is upon you. It's sleepwalking. And I can tell you, to the betrayed spouse, when the unfaithful spouse is sleepwalking, it is incredibly disheartening and discouraging and frustrating and alarming because immediately the betrayed spouse wonders, are they going to relapse again? Are they going to do, all over, do this all over again? Or are they still involved with their affair partner or their acting out behavior? Or is this the end and is this the beginning of the end? And if you're an unfaithful spouse, when your betrayed spouse is kind of sleepwalking and going through the motions, right, there's an incredible amount of fear and intrepidation. Are they done? Are they given up? Are they never going to do any work? Are they, are they not going to be a part? And maybe this is the end and nothing I do works. And that can spill over into incredible anger and frustration. So sleepwalking and recovery can be prevalent for both sides. So here's a few ways to shake yourself shake your spouse or your partner in the middle of sleepwalking. Number one, you've got to get expert help. You can go online to affairrecovery.com. The boot camp is free. You can do that. After that, you may take an online course. There's different forums online that you can be a part of. Get a membership to affairrecovery.com. You can watch videos, private videos that aren't accessible to the public. You can take courses. There's books. There's things like that that you can do. Because if you're just 
going to exist. You're not going to get any good recovery work done. And all you're doing is frustrating your spouse, who you secretly really probably want to win back, or you're frustrating your own recovery because there's no positive momentum because you're stuck in the enormity of what you're feeling. Number one, you can't fix what you don't confront. If you're not confronting yourself in some way in your recovery, now, I'm sorry, but it's true, betrayed or unfaithful, if you're not confronting yourself in this situation that you're in, I would challenge you to open yourself up to the possibility that maybe you're not seeing everything that you need to see. And maybe there's some things that you need to confront in you because my response is my responsibility, regardless of what side of infidelity you're on. Number two, I've been doing this all year because I was challenged to do it, and it's really helped me be far more present and aware in life. And that is something called contemplating. Now, some people call it contemplating prayer or contemplative prayer. A number of you don't come from faith, and that's totally cool. You can still meditate or contemplate. And what that looks like for me is no music, no phone calls, no texting, nothing. A lot of times when I'm driving or I'll sit in my backyard when it's really a peaceful time of day, and I just really kind of exist. I contemplate. Uh, for me, I do use contemplative prayer, but sometimes I also just meditate, and I try and find a peace within myself that is not hurry, hurry, hurry. It's not sleepwalking, just trying to find out how I'm going to survive and pay my bills and get through the week or the day. No, it is staying present with where I am at mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually. Number three, and this one kind of hurts, but I think you need to hear it because I needed to hear it, is stop running. Regardless of what side that you're on, you have to stop running from what is confronting you, whether it be oppression, hopelessness, just that overwhelming ilk that you feel. Uh, if you're an unfaithful, you're typically the runner, running from help or running from getting you know, expert help or running from therapy sessions or running from the discussions that you have to have with your betrayed spouse. And so we have a tendency to run. It's not uncommon, though, that the betrayed spouse can run too. They can run from having to to confront some things or run from having to process through the pain or run from having to start to build some momentum eventually towards forgiveness. Notice that I didn't say reconciliation because you can forgive without reconciling and you can start to work on forgiving even though you're not working on reconciliation. But it's imperative that you stop running because the more that you run, the more that you're losing ground towards freedom, towards personal restoration, and just really getting your life back. The final one, and I saved this one for last because I think it needs to be the hardest hitting one, is to seek to obtain what uh, Richard Rohr calls a beginner's mind in your recovery. Regardless of what side you are on, I think there comes a point where we have to own the fact that we don't yet know all that there is to know about ourselves about our spouse, about recovery, about infidelity, about all that we're trying to manage in our life right now. You see, a beginner's mind really produces in you an eagerness, a drive, a desire, a commitment, a freshness to learn what you need to learn, to see what you need to see, to see things anew. And it's really hard as we get into midlife and beyond because we feel like we've seen all there is to see, we've been burned enough times, we get bitter, we get, you know, we start to question the intention behind even therapists or guys like me and all that. I get all that, but I really want to encourage you to find a beginner's mind. Admit that you don't know everything that you think that you know or that you don't know all there is to know about your spouse, yourself, or recovery. Because I promise you it'll change your life. If you can aspire, if you can at least pursue a beginner's mind about recovery, about your marriage, about maybe even your parenting difficulties, if you can achieve that or at least start the process towards grabbing hold of that, and I have by no means mastered it, but I have been forced into obtaining a beginner's mind throughout seasons of my life uh, due to poor choices, uh, self-deception, uh, recession, financial difficulty, what have you. 
But I promise you, if you can at least commit to getting back to a beginner's mind, it will absolutely change your life. It will absolutely renew and alter your recovery because you will stop thinking that you know everything and you will be passionate about finding answers to the agony that you are trying to work through in your life.